Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I am pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Kay Matthew Dames and Tony Zanders, co-author of Chapter 19, The Library CEO, Money in the Bank, People on the Bus. Kay Matthew Dames serves as Edward H. Arnold, Dean of Hesburgh Libraries and University of Notre Dame Press at the New University of Notre Dame. Dames serves as the 61st president of the Association of Research Libraries from 2021 to 2022. Tony Zanders is founder and chief executive officer of Skill Type, an American talent management and data company that enhances the performance of libraries and their workforce. Sanders served as an uh, entrepreneur in residence as part of the executive team with co-author Dames at Boston University's he, um, University Libraries. He previously served as vice president at Ex Libris Group and S EBSCO. Throughout chapter 19, Matthew Dames and Tony Sanders highlight the changed roles of the chief librarian in research libraries since the pandemic. They note how meeting user needs, providing appropriate technology and facilities, cultivating a customer-centered culture, and aligning priorities to, be, um, to the organization's strategic goals have always been and continue to be key strategies of the chief librarian. However, decreased enrollments in higher education have placed growing pressures on library budgets. Talent management, including retaining staff, has become a key strategy that benefits the library as well as its operating budget. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome Matthew Dames and Tony Zanders. Welcome. Hi, Thanks. good to be here. Good to be here. So happy to have this conversation with you. I'd like to get started by asking you to briefly describe what your vision is for the future of libraries in 2035. Tony, you want to start that off? Sure. I thought that it would be a long time away, but uh, time flies. It's already 2024 and um, 10 years from now, uh, roughly, I think we're starting to see the glimpse of the role uh, artificial intelligence is playing on our work. Um, and 2035, will, I believe, will include um, uh, people being able to do a lot more uh, a lot of mundane tasks that take up our days um, uh, being done by um, artificial intelligence uh, applications and our organizations um, will perform more work, uh, not necessarily with more people, uh, but with um, the assistance of, of large computing power. Um, and I think the libraries will be able to um, meet the needs of a, of a, of a much broader community uh, as a result. Um, and so I have a, an optimistic view around the role uh, libraries will be able to play in the next 10 years uh, because of the advances we're seeing in, in technology. Thank you, Tony. I'll echo Tony in one sense. I do think that there are some grand opportunities for uh, libraries as organizations. Um, I am a little bit concerned about the staffing and the talent within libraries. Um, picking up exactly where he left off, the, the whole artificial intelligence piece um, is extraordinarily powerful in ways that I didn't quite expect. I mean, just this week, uh, one of the things that Tony and I have been working on is uh, uh, sort of a, a project, and we are going back and forth with drafts of of notes and ideas. And one of the things that I had committed to this year was to find a sustainable way to sort of record my thoughts into some sort of audio form and transcribe them quickly into... Uh, text so that Tony could read and sort of review and give his opinion on these these thoughts for this project. And literally the turnaround time on 2,000 word uh, pieces, literally I can go from draft to, I can go from an audio draft off the top of my head to a transcription to a 
pretty well edited version to send to Tony in less than an hour. And this is without any, this is, you know, without any time to learn my cadence of speech. Um, it distinguished Sanders from Xanders on the second go round. And it's pretty impressive what what's what's available. And I think that we're in a in a in a time of some great opportunity. I think the organizations who are facile enough and talented enough to take advantage of this technology will do well. Um, I think that the individuals, however, I think may find some some challenges because a lot of the uh, the work that we have done, uh, what we call here sustainer work, may be at risk and may be uh, may be mechanized through technology. Well, thank you. I think that uh, you're, you've already started to answer my uh, next question and you might have more to add to it, but what are you most concerned about as you look into the future? I can take this one to start. I think the concerns uh, um, do echo uh, Matthew's sentiment around um, uh, individuals not perhaps being prepared, but I don't believe it's a capability issue. I believe it's a mindset issue. Um, We've seen countless people reinvent themselves and their work over the course of the pandemic. Um, the average professional um, statistics show is changing entire careers five to seven times after college graduation. And um, we have, again, countless examples of, of um, exhibiting uh, this ability to um, adapt. Uh, to, to new types of work. Um, however, in, in, in the library profession, um, there is a, a mindset shift that needs to take place that um, changes that are taking place in society or, or at our institutions or even within our libraries um, are not personal or unique to us. Um, these, are, these are global trends, um, national trends, um, but they do impact our work. Um, and so I think if uh, the, the mindset prevails that I'm being attacked because I'm asked to do something different, uh, that I think will pose a lot of challenges to, to people's ability to adjust. Um, and so I think we, that does concern me that we um, haven't figured out a way to overcome the, 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 the mindset uh, that prohibits people from um, seeing the opportunity and the change as opposed to the, the, the risk or the threat. Yeah, I would say that um, I agree with sort of the mindset shift. Uh, I'll will go back to sort of these uh, this computing power, um, and particularly artificial intelligence. We are, uh, for better or worse, we're at a point now where the whole notion of facts and truth seem to be under assault and under question. And I think that we have a scenario where um, artificial intelligence, if not checked, will be in a position to exacerbate the questions about truth and fact. That's particularly dangerous in a 2024 uh, where globally uh, we, have, we have presidential or leadership elections uh, at a scale that we have not seen in quite some time, uh, including here in the United States. And we don't have in the United States or to my knowledge elsewhere, we do not have any um, mechanism to keep uh, technology from challenging truth uh, and fact when it comes to elections and democracy. Libraries rest upon those foundations, and if those foundations are shaken, then the whole notion of what a library is and can be also is shaken. So uh, I do have concerns about how this is going to play out as soon as 2024, but in the next 10 years as well. Thank you, uh, Tony and Matthew. Um, I'd like to shift and uh, take a little bit more positive spin and, and looking ahead into the future. What 
excites you the most about uh, what's ahead for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly excited about um, the unique part of, of working in libraries in 2024 being that we have organizations with people from every generation. Um, there, there are over five generations of, of, of people working in the organization at the same time. Uh, you have your um, Gen Z folks entering our workforce uh, as, as, as not just student workers, but also entry-level employees, um, all the way up to um, our, our baby boomers uh, and, and Gen X and, and, and millennials in between. Um, and we've never had this opportunity to cross pollinate, uh, our, our, our wisdom, our expertise. Um, there's things each generation can teach one another, um, to reach these increasingly diverse audiences we have to serve. Um, I don't think we've seen that potential, uh, unlocked just yet. Uh, and so I think over the next, um, um, 10 years, uh, as we look to 2035, um, that's something I'm really excited to see the potential of, of reached. Thank you. I got into libraries because, um, I saw the potential to do great things and really to run a, an information organization in a non-traditional way. And I think that if you are, uh, technologically curious, if you are studious, if you are astute, if you are incisive, um, there really is not a better time really to get into uh, being in a library and running a library organization if that's what you want to do. I know there, there are uh, lots of challenges before us, uh, but I think the opportunity is so rich in this space that uh, for literally the best and the brightest uh if we're able to get them to come through and to stay i think that uh the future for this sector is going to be incredibly bright thank you both um i'd like to talk a little bit about what you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade Uh, as a, a software entrepreneur, um, uh, I think the, the the thing top of mind for me is the the move to the cloud um, and the move to the digital um, uh, um, space. Uh, our libraries used to be um, a, a physical building with physical uh, books and goods. Um, in the early 21st century, uh, we became that physical building uh, with a website uh with a, a small digital footprint um today however uh and over the past decade uh, many of our libraries if you look at the statistics um have become primarily a, a digital operation a, a digital footprint with a a, a decreasing um, um physical footprint and, and and that shift uh to be primarily digital uh, and to um, have to train our our, our workforce on uh, managing uh, digital properties, interacting with with patrons in a digital way, I think that's the biggest shift that that's taken place. It used to be something that was for, uh, nice to have for well-to-do organizations. Today, you can't reach your audience without having a, a digital footprint, um, and that was not the case uh, in in 2010, 2011, and 12. Thank you. Uh, I was going to go with, and I will go with, um, the shift from analog to digital and just raw computing power, which is sort of a predecessor to what Tony was talking about with the, with the cloud. Um, just, uh, I do remember, and this was in college, so I am old enough, unfortunately, uh, where, in college, I did take a typing course uh, because uh, I felt I needed to type. My papers needed to be typed and you know you type them out. And literally we began this particular session talking about me speaking into a handheld recorder on a phone 
uh, uploading it to a cloud service, a cloud-based transcription service. And after 15 minutes of uh, speaking, I can upload this into a cloud service and get back uh, a 2,000-word essay where the trans uh, the transcription is about 85 90% with no training the computing power necessary to do that just in you know a, a handful of decades is uh it's ridiculous and so uh to me the biggest impact on our field and the work that we have done uh rests to me in sort of the computer chip Moore's law, things of that nature, and what what it has allowed us to do uh, today and in the future. Thank you. And what do you think, as we look ahead, is going to have the biggest impact on libraries in the next decade? I think there, there's external uh, impacts and internal ones, um, and I'll, I want to focus on the internal because I think we're all talking about AI and how it will disrupt um, and change the way we work. But I want to focus on the internal impacts, and I think the biggest impact will be leadership. Um, these are these are organizations that um, have become increasingly political. Um, the, the 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 funding for them. Uh, the the advocacy for them, um, the role they play in the research enterprise, if you're an academic library, or the role they play in the um, kind of um, community outcomes, if you're a municipal out, out, uh, 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 library, a public library. But the biggest impact will be the leadership and um, preparing leaders who are um, not just experts in managing information, uh, but but managing uh, relationships, managing people, um, being able to um, ensure that your organization has a seat at the table, um, understanding that your role is, again, uh, one where you must not just be technologically savvy, but you have to be politically savvy. Um, and uh, without leadership that sees that their role is that of a, of a CEO, essentially, um, the worst outcomes we could imagine will happen to the library. Um, we will, our, our greatest fears will be realized. Um, you know, um, you know, technology will take jobs if there's no one advocating that they don't. Um, patrons will go to other resources to access information. Um, funding will go elsewhere. Um, unless we, again, have a, a leadership class that understands its role and assumes its role as, um, um, as CEOs of, of their of their organization, yeah, I'm going to e just echo Tony in terms of his conclusion. I'm going to get there a slightly different way. Uh, one of the things that we talk about here in our executive team meetings is we can't reasonably expect and should not expect that uh, the expectations of our customer base and those expectations being shaped by Amazon, Google, Meta, Insta, TikTok, insert Microsoft, insert large influential tech company in the, in the blank space. We shouldn't expect that our customers' expectations that are shaped by those companies are expectations that they don't bring with them into the library space, whether that space is digital or terrestrial, right? We are actually on the outside of the technology space. We have a part in that. We are part of that sector, albeit on the, I think, on the far ends of that sector, but we are in that sector. And part of what Tony is talking about with leadership is that I think part of what we need to do in terms of the sector is to have people acknowledge that and to work accordingly so that not only not only do we bring to the table the things that we need to bring to the table in terms of unique skills and assets 
and thought processes and policies and values. But also we need to bring those things in a way and we need to sell those skills and those opportunities in a way so that we actually do have a seat at the table when we need to have a seat at the table. And quite frankly, we need to have a seat at the table more often than we are actually at the table. Thank you. Uh, I think those are all very important for us to be uh, having that seat at the table. So I think uh, we need to help uh, advocate for our own futures. So I think that you've raised really important points. Um, I wondered, it's been a few months since you've submitted your chapter um, to for the manuscript. And I was wondering if your thinking has changed at all since you've written that chapter. Tony? I don't, I don't think mine has. Um, these have been a set of ideas uh, that we've been ruminating on uh, for the better part of um, six years or so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they predate uh, the pandemic. They predate uh, the commercialization of, uh, of AI. Um, and um, I think that they're a set of evergreen uh, first principles um, that um, libraries um, uh, need to conceive themselves as organizations, uh, not simply collections. And as a result, um, yeah, I don't think much has changed. Um, I think the late, we will always have a trend du jour that dominates the headlines. Right now it's AI. Uh, a couple of years ago it was DEI. A few years before that, uh, you know, you can insert again, um, whatever the, the news headline is, but the, 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 the key remains that the libraries mm -hmm. uh, are organizations that need to be managed accordingly. Yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would second that. I mean, one of the things that Tony, and I, Tony and I have been talking about uh, recently is, you know, we need to let the main thing be the main thing. And part of the main thing for libraries is, look, these are, these are organizations, uh, where people need to be managed. Budgets need to be managed. Politics need to be managed. Uh, there's a whole, it's part of the reason I got into this space was because I, again, I saw the opportunity to manage a full-fledged 360 degree information organization. Um, and I think with the challenges that we've seen, particularly in the last, uh, say 15 months and going forward, I think we're, you know, we're, we're seeing that and we're seeing the need for that. And it's just sort of justifying what we have said in the chapter. Great. Thank you. Well, I think this, I'd love to hear your thoughts and I know you have some advice for what you think information, uh, any advice for information professionals as they look forward to the future in the next 10 years, what would you say to them? Um, I think regardless of where you are in the information profession, you, you've just begun your journey. Uh, you're on your, um, you know, 20th year of service, uh, or you're aspiring uh, to become a librarian or a, a library worker, um, I think my main advice is um, the world is your oyster. Um, there, There is anything is possible for you in your career right now. Um, you can, the, the entire organization is being rethought reorganized uh, the relationship the library has to its partner departments or their, their, their partner organization, all of it's being rethought. Um, and there is a true talent shortage of, of people to serve in the information profession. Uh, what that means is that you're, you're, you are needed. Uh, um, there are the demand for information professionals far exceeds the supply. And as a result, um, whatever you put your mind to, uh, you can get there in a short number of years. Um, and that's, I think my advice is just to understand that you, you just set a goal. Um, and, um, there are ample opportunities for, for skill development, for um, applying those skills, um, 
What's needed, though, are, are willing participants to help the library realize its potential. And if you're willing to, if you want to put in the work, um, you can, if you're not technical today, you can become technical. Uh, if you're technical today, but you want to be more, more people facing, those are skills you can learn. Um, what's, and so I would just be encouraged um, that there's, there's more work to be done than, than people today to, to do it. Um, and so just have that mindset and you can make an impact for your personal career along with the communities you serve. Yeah, the, the opportunities, um, we, Tony and I talk a lot about what we think is, uh, is hampering libraries or what's wrong with libraries or the challenges that libraries have. And I think, you know, there is, uh, there is a place for that conversation. He and I have had that conversation. We'll continue to have this conversation, uh, both, you know, through this chapter and through other means. But the the opportunities are just so ridiculously rich. <laughs> it's just um, they really are. I mean, with with all the all the challenges, and there are many challenges. But with all the challenges, the the opportunities uh, to not only just do your thing, but do your thing in different ways in five, six, seven different iterations. There are not many professions where you can uh, get in and shape shift like that. There really aren't. And so I just think that the opportunities for, you know, really savvy, talented people are just incredibly rich. Well, I'm really excited to hear you say how um, say those things. I've always felt that about our field and I feel that the opportunities are even more rich as you've described. So is there anything that information professionals can do that can better prepare them for, for this desired future? Um, you know, learn something new each day. Um, have an open mind. Um, when you attend meetings, you're invited to uh, pay attention, take notes, be engaged. Um, you never know when that that information, that tidbit, that um, idea will will come into play for you. It could be years later. Um, but working in libraries, uh, again, whether you're a public library and you're now being tasked with new duties from your your mayor's office, from the the from you know, other departments across the city, um, you, you play an instrumental role in making sure your community um, reaches its, its, its potential. Um, and so same thing for academic libraries. Um, student outcomes is the name of the game. And you're in a prime position working in that library um, to help the university uh, reach its, its potential. And so, um, you know, that's the biggest thing is, is just every day you show up to work, it's, it, it is a privilege. Um, and there are people around the world who wish they had an opportunity um, to, to, to work with information, help people perform research, uh, help people have their light bulb moments for their personal careers. Um, and in the public libraries, there's so many ways to make an impact um, and people really need our help navigating this complex information landscape. Um, it doesn't fall on me that we're in 2024, it's an election year. There's gonna be a lot of rigorous debate and conversations, people trying to figure out where they fall on certain issues, uh, how to navigate the news landscape and libraries. This is our time to shine. This is our year, uh, really. Every four years we have one to really play a prominent role uh, and preparing an informed citizenry. So, um, just, just get engaged. Um, you know, obviously there are always things to, to improve and things to complain about. Um, but you're not alone. Um, the library is not uniquely dysfunctional. Uh, there <laughs> dysfunction, uh, is a part of organizations. that families are dysfunctional. Right. And, and, um, you know, I would just focus on the, the opportunities we have, uh, every day when we're asked to, to show up to work and, um, uh, and help make a difference in people's lives. I will say that 
one of the things that I uh, that I've tried to help folks with in my position as a, as a supervisor, as a manager, as a leader, is I've always tried to help them see what the opportunity is and to help them navigate towards that opportunity. Um, one of the things I don't see enough of is, uh, and I want to, and I'm actually trying to actively help people do this, is how to manage their career within librarianship. This is a career, it can be extraordinarily rewarding, it can be even lucrative, but you've got to manage your career just as if you were in any corporation, as if you were in any government agency, any public sector uh, organization, you have to be, you have to bring an intentionality to it. You have to bring intelligence to it. You have to be savvy about it. You have to be the beneficiary of some fortune, right? Um, and part of what I've been trying to do in my positions is to help people, A, understand that this is a career that needs to be managed, B, that this is a career worth managing, um, and C, provide you know tools, tips, tricks, advice, guidance, counsel on how to best manage your career. This can be extraordinarily uh, rewarding in a lot of the ways that we want our careers to be rewarding, but it's not just going to happen on its own. You've got to, there's ops, and every time there's ops or opportunities, you've got to move on those. It's just not going to fall in your lap most of the time. So I, I think career management uh, is is what I'm looking to foster and what I'm hoping uh, more of our professionals will will acknowledge and be intentional about. I'm really glad that you said that because I do think that that is something that oftentimes um, people in our field don't necessarily recognize. So that idea of career management and being really intentional about that, I think is super important for people to be thinking about. So uh, what do you think are some of the key competencies that librarians will need to thrive in the year 2035? Uh, I think uh, collaboration, um, you know, I don't, I don't, pref I don't like the, the descriptor of these skills as soft skills, uh, cause they're not soft. They're actually really difficult. I understand the technical distinction, but, um, they're really hard actually <laughs> just to, you know, play, make a pun on that, that, that distinction. But, uh, I think collaboration, um, customer service, uh, I think just having a, a customer service orientation, uh, even if you're not patron facing, uh, you know, your colleagues on your team in your department are customers of yours, right? If you're, if you're the expert, you're doing cataloging, you're, you're, you're managing data, um, you have customers and to have a customer service orientation, I think will be critical. Um, um, I think it's the, it's the, the unique things that we're able to do as people that AI can't do. Um, that we really need to improve on. Um, you'll see the lists of everyone needs to be more data savvy. Uh, people should learn how to code and you'll, you'll see these lists, but I'm actually a contrarian here in the sense that um, I don't think we should try to compete with the things that AI can do better than us. Um, I think that we should hone and double down on the things that we can uniquely do. Um, and so um you can sort of fill in the rest of the blanks there, but but um, being someone who can solve problems, who can listen well to understanding what the problem is, someone who's a joy to work with, a uh, pleasure to work with. Um, these are the types of interpersonal communications. Um, these are the types of skills that I think um, we all need to take onus of uh, for ourselves. Yeah, the, the skills... Uh, or the competencies that I'm looking for are in one way simple. 
but then they're really not simple. Um, when I look at how I recruit, I mean, yes, we, there are things that we need to fill in terms of the position description. Um, but my team can sort of interview and weed out for those. By the time it gets to me, if it gets to me, uh, I'm looking for somebody who's curious. I'm looking for hunger. I can't tell you how easy it is for me to find somebody who's hungry and somebody who's not within three minutes. I know if you're hungry for this position and the opportunity as opposed to not. It's it's pretty apparent. Um, curiosity, hunger, ingenuity, the ability to develop solutions, answer questions, solve problems out of uh, issues that are not immediately apparent. Those are the competencies, and I do think those are competencies, right? You develop those over time. You develop those by being in different situations. You develop those by being put in situations or intentionally putting yourself in situations where you're not the subject expert, where you know you are not the most intelligent person in that room. And you lean into that and you say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to work through this problem because this is not my area of expertise, but I know I need to learn this because I have a sense of where the profession is going or where this particular part of uh, my job is going, right? So those are all things that, those are all things that are critically important competencies to me. And I do think of those as competencies and, the, and those go back to, the whole notion of how are you managing your career? Because if you don't have those three competencies, you can't manage your career appropriately. Well, thank you. I have one final question for you as we wrap up. And I'd love for you both to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. This was a fun exercise I've never done before. And so I appreciate this, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> what I came up with was society's third place improving human outcomes excellent mm. i don't have anything nearly that profound uh not even close okay uh i guess i don't have six i guess it's really uh five um caveat m tour which is latin for buyer beware and choose wisely Excellent. Great. Well, I know that was a challenging uh, uh, way to conclude, uh, but I, I think you both did great. And those are excellent ways to summarize the future of libraries. So I'd like to uh, thank Kay Matthew Deems and Tony Zanders for joining me today. And I also want to thank you again for your contribution to Library 2035, imagining the next generation of libraries. It has been a true pleasure to talk with both of you today about your vision of, for the future of libraries. So thank you so much. Thank you as well. Glad to do it. Thanks so much. Take care. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending this webcast with Kay Matthew Deems and Tony Zanders, co-authors of Chapter 19, The Library CEO, Money in the Bank, People on the Bus. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you again.